Hey everybody, my name is Jared and I am a Master Mason in the state of Mississippi in the United States of America. Showing off the bicentennial tie, giving props to the good old state of Mississippi for our 200 year anniversary here in the state of Mississippi. And our tie was done up by Mississippi Mason, Edgar Alejandro over at Masonic Revival. Uh, so everybody, uh, first off, welcome. Uh, I'm very grateful to have everybody here on the live chat uh, with us for this live show. Uh, you can see that I have a guest with me. I'm going to have him introduce himself in just a second, but a uh, quick hint, that's his book right there. And we're going to talk to him about doing research, specifically Masonic research. So Joseph, please take a moment and introduce yourself to the crowd. Well, crowd, uh, this is Joe Wages here from uh, good old Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm editor of Secret School of Wisdom, Blue Friar, a handful of lodges of research. Uh, pretty much I like doing research, and that's kind of my bag. All right. So uh, let's uh, tell everybody just for a quick second, give them an idea what it means to be a Blue Friar. That's some sort of recognition from Masonic authors to Masonic authors, is it not? That's right. And it was started back in the 30s. I'm number 108 right now. So there's only been 108 of us so far. And so, you know, it's really uh, totally unexpected for me, but like like one of the most extreme honors I can you know, possibly conceive. So I'm you know, grateful to be a part of it. So I'm sure there's probably more that went into that than this, but I, I think it has to be noted that here you are, a man just like the rest of us. You wake up, you go to work, you come home, you take care of your children, you're married, have a whole family life to take care of, and yet somehow at the same time cranked out a book that nobody else had uh, uh, most of the information that you have in that book of. So that's what uh, we're here to talk about tonight, folks. Not necessarily how you do a, a, a big book about the Illuminati or other things that, that seem such large scope, though I think that Joseph would agree with me that that's well within your wheelhouse if you make the opportunity to do it. Um, but all of us need some place to, to start. So, uh, Joseph, what do, what do you think? Is is something like uh, your book here, and, and I don't think you've said it yet, but tell us what the name of your book is and what what about that book um, constitutes original research? That's a, the catchphrase I hear all the time about your book. Okay. Well, so the uh, book's The Secret School of Wisdom, and it's original research in that no one's ever published the entire ritual system of the Illuminati in any language, uh, let alone translated into English there's a lot of moving parts in it and so there's the main bulk of the archive stuff comes from the secret state archives in germany uh various lodges around uh germany also we took all the different texts uh merged them together uh did a little bit of textual criticism translated the whole thing out and you know it, it's a project that took about five years to do and it wasn't easy and like you say with a family and wife and kids and stuff and that would seem to be an impossible project the, the good news for me is i don't really sleep very much maybe like three or four hours so that that's part of the secret and so if you want to be a regular family man and do this stuff um you know maybe after the wife and kids go to bed somewhere between nine and ten if you work every night till two or three in the morning and do that for five years and never take any time off you can pretty much accomplish it <laughs> But it's like anything, like if you if you take like a, a like a really big uh, project that you've got in mind and you break it into small bite sized little pieces and you don't let up, and you just slowly grind on it. You can pretty much accomplish anything you want to. Uh, not, not, not everyone's going to want to write a secret school of wisdom or a book like that. But, you know, there's a place for everyone to start. And so the kind of the big thing for me is doing research in general. So maybe if people would think about doing like something like their local lodge, right? Like take your local lodge minutes and get them all digitized and transcribe them. And then what you end up doing is preserving your lodge's history for the foreseeable future. And it's really important work that I think could be done. And, you know, if you want to go a step further than that, then maybe go to the Grand Lodge level or, you know, just pick an interesting topic. Just whatever motivates you, there's a place for everyone to start at and anyone can do this kind of work. It just requires persistence. And if you get, you know, hit stumbling blocks, don't stop what you're doing. Stop at that one spot and work around it. And a lot of times when you go back to the original problem, it's already solved itself. So that's kind of like uh, in a nutshell, like how I do things. Well, I think you bring up an important point there. And, and I would summarize it by calling it uh, time management. And 
you know, I, I think each of us experience this. Uh, you know, I myself uh, have a full-time job. I'm going to college full-time and, of course, have many obligations in Lodge and other places as well. Uh, have my own family at home to care for as well. And really what it boils down to is what you want to dedicate your time to. You know, so for case in point, uh, for me today, I spent many hours this morning working out in my yard, getting some things done around the yard that now that it wasn't 100 degrees outside, it felt comfortable enough to do it. Uh, then I have a 15 year old son who's got his learning permit. So we went out and I was giving him his only his second lesson in how to drive. And so we went out and did that for a few hours. But then when I came home and I had a couple hours break between that and this show, I could have chose to do so much with that time. I didn't have anything that that was calling for me. I could have done whatever I wanted. But what I chose to do was sit down, relax and watch a couple shows on TV. Whereas if you're really dedicated to something, if you really want to do something, I mean, that's, that's the opportunities you have to grab is, is like you're saying, you know, the family's asleep. I'm not ready to go to sleep anyway. So let me put my effort into this thing that I'm interested in and is actually going to benefit me and not just the relaxation of the TV. So are, are we talking about the same thing here? We're talking about exactly the same thing. Like if you want to do the, uh, you know, serious type scholarship, Probably one of the first things you want to do is unplug that TV or stop watching all the different programs. I'm not saying you can't watch TV, but it's a huge distraction and it eats up a lot of your time. Um, like when you're kind of doing some of that mon mundane work, maybe you put on like in the background, put some music in the background. Like, and I, I kind of like listening to uh, to Bach. He's he's a lot of fun. But like if you get Glenn Gould to perform it. But, you know, really like any type of like just slow, like kind of grinding music in the background while you're doing this kind of work, you know, nothing that's going to put you to sleep. And uh, you'd be surprised how much stuff you can get accomplished. And you, when you just kind of take some of the distractions away and just sit and focus for a little bit, because really like an hour of focused work might be worth three or four hours of like semi-focused work if you, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely agree. Okay, so here we are trying to figure out where to take this first bite of this enormous elephant. And that, that elephant is Masonic research. And, and just like that elephant, there's so many different ways to try to attack it because we have actual history of masonry. Where did it actually begin? We have interpretation of symbolism. We have all the in-depth esoterics, as people like to call it, and I'm sure hundreds of other little things. And then we can splice those off where we can say, okay, well, are we talking about the origins of Freemasonry as an entire organization? Or are we talking about the origins of Freemasonry for a particular Grand Lodge or in a particular country or state? Or are we talking about it uh, for a particular lodge? And then we could go even further and split that off even more and say, well, is it for the state? Is it for Prince Hall? Is it for something else like uh, your Illuminati book? You know, so there's there's so many different possible topics out there that I think sometimes the sheer scope of what's available overwhelms people. Um, so, well, let's let's stop right there. How what kind of advice might you give somebody on how to narrow their scope? What what it is with all these options out there? How do they decide what to focus on, at least maybe at first? OK, so the first thing that you need to, to probably have or if you're trying to do international work, you've got to be able to speak a foreign language, uh, preferably French, also German and also Spanish, probably in that order. So French, German, Spanish, in addition to English. And if you can do if you can do any of those uh, those three foreign languages, uh, you, you've probably got a chance at doing the, the research. The second thing you might want to do is get a mentor. So whatever it is that you're looking to do, um, if it's not international work, if it's national work or if it's state work or if it's local lodge level work, depending on where you want to get in, you need a mentor. So say you're doing local lodge history, maybe get with the treasurer or not treasurer, with the secretary, uh, maybe look at some of the old minute books and kind of familiarize yourself with that. But um, Kind of when I when I pick a topic on anything I want to research, I go and I read literally everything that's ever been read about it. And once you do that, you start going through those books, you check the footnotes out and you find their primary sources and you get to the root of that stuff. Or if it references other papers, now you've got to read these other papers. And so there's there's a whole lot of uh, planning that goes in, in, into depth in it. But the method's the same no matter where you start. So basically, you got to burrow down into primary source material 
while having a mentor and uh, if you know if foreign languages are are your thing then maybe that's a good avenue for you for uh, international research but if you don't speak any foreign languages and I really encourage like everyone out there to study foreign languages because it really opens up things in your mind and you see things that you don't normally see otherwise so uh, you know with with that being a call to action to go learn a foreign language um, really you want to start uh, you know wherever it is that you fit in best but you have to have mentorship because if you try and do this on your own it's kind of like like the whole purpose of like for for writing anything down anyways is the trans uh generational transmission of knowledge right so that way you're not starting off at square one you're starting off where the author of that book left off and it's the same kind of thing with research if you'll read everything that everyone's already said already you're so much further ahead of the game that you can basically pick up the pieces where they were last left standing and then work with them from there and then by investigating their source materials maybe you determine oh well that was a uh, actually not a right conclusion or actually Actually, they miss something much bigger here and so what it does is it it, it gives you competence is, is the idea so uh, Joseph we have a question here from one of the viewers I think it's the next logical question uh, bodybuilding occultist asks well how do you get a mentor where, where should somebody be looking for these mentors well, it, it's really like the things that you're interested in. So like if maybe you like something that I've written, well, drop me a line and say, hey, I'm looking at this and this topic. What do you know about it? And then they can uh, bounce ideas off of them. Um, so really, it starts with like, who do you read the most? Like wh what's what uh, Masonic authors or otherwise do you want to learn from? It's kind of like if you were uh, a jazz musician, right? You would go find someone that you really like listening to and playing with, and then you work and play with that person and you start learning some of the things that they do. And maybe there's also a transmission though, like some of the things that you're doing get swapped both ways. So it's, it's not just a one way street. There's a, it's like a transmission of knowledge and ideas. And it's important to have that because you don't want to operate in a vacuum. You want to have guidance, right? But you want to have someone better than yourself. And by having someone better than you, it allows you to reach further than what your potential is. Okay. So maybe I have an interest in just the, the pure history, like, like the literal history of Freemasonry, not uh, as, you know, usually if you're in a, if you're in the Southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite, you've taken any of the master craftsman courses or been involved in education there, you're going to hear the words authentic and romantic. So what we're looking for here is I'm using this in the terms of the authentic history, you know, the provable history of Freemasonry. So if that's what I'm interested in, my first step would be to start reading about it, do the research right. in terms of not, not that I'm trying to do research to go type a paper necessarily, but, but to educate myself, I'm going to go read some books. And then maybe out of some of that material, I find somebody who either the, the way they present their information or how well it is cited and easy to be followed back, whatever the case is, that person really speaks to me. I need to realize that that's a real human being and I can reach out to that person, try to find them, even if it takes going through a publisher or something like that, chances are I, c I can find the individual. Exactly. And so like a, most of the papers that I've read, if the person's still alive, I've talked with that person. And what you'll find is when you talk to these people that write these papers, you know, what were the circumstances surrounding when they published the papers? Did they have something going on in their life? Did they forget to include something? Did they wish they expanded somewhere else? Do they wish now that the paper's been out for a few years that they hadn't said something because they have evidence to the contrary? So all that kind of information is priceless. I mean, like it really is because not only do you have a paper and you can refer to their sources, but you can have insight into what it took to make that paper or to make that book and it can point you into new directions and so the, the idea is is you want it to be like a mutually beneficial exchange with uh, whoever it is you're trying to get to mentor you so i think when it comes down to research there's a lot of different reasons somebody might do Masonic research. They, they may just have a genuine curiosity about a certain topic, but they may also have a, a, a deeper reason. Like they might be a lodge education officer and they're needing to just provide a little 15 minute segment in a lodge meeting one day, or maybe they're in a jurisdiction that requires a research paper as a proficiency or other form of, of advancement or membership into a particular lodge, such as maybe a lodge of research uh, might require them to do a paper. Uh, and, and we can and just keep counting on fingers, but there's different reasons that they might have to uh, do this research. And 
I think uh, for me personally, that's really the only way I can talk is what, what kind of feelings I've had uh, in the past. You sit there and you think 300 years of known Freemasonry from, you know, we'll just call 1717 that and, and say, okay, 300 years, there's been innumerable authors, whether it's been an article in a newspaper, some little leaflet that was drawn up and passed around or uh, full out books, encyclopedias, whatever the case may be. Freemasonry has had its fair share of authors and researchers. And if you pick particular topics, you might be talking about things that have been written about for centuries or millennia. If you get into the esoteric side of things and the, the deeper mystery school meanings behind things. So I personally sometimes feel this like writer's block of, well, okay, I want to do something about the 47th problem of Euclid, but what on earth could I possibly add to that chorus? How, do, how, how can I be a voice in a chorus that's been singing for over 300 years about this and, and provide anything meaningful? So have you ever experienced that uh, in any sort of way or, or otherwise have advice to somebody on how to shed that inhibition and just do it? Absolutely. So the first thing you probably want to do is look at like your research because this is your time. It's a it's a it's a thing that you're never going to get back in this life. And it's your time. You only have a limited amount while we're here on this plane of existence. That being the case, you want to you want your work to be meaningful and to provide value. So if economics is the study of scarcity, then you want to have scarce or very seldom commented on information, just something where you can break new ground or, uh, you know, that hasn't really had a lot of discussion on it, you know, something valuable like that. And so that's that's probably a good place to start is you want your your time you're going to invest in something to be worthwhile. So you pick a topic that very little has been said on it. So. I, I've never read any books like on early uh, Mississippi Masonic Grand Lodge activity. Sounds like a great place to start. You know what I'm saying? Or, uh, you know, what, what did the uh, first uh, ritual look like in Texas when the uh, Grand Lodge of Texas was uh, formed? That's a worthwhile project. But like, you know, contem contemplating like the circumpunct or like, you know, or, or doing something that doesn't have a concrete uh really meaning in the symbolism like that it's more interpretive because it's a speculative sort of thing maybe that's not a good use of someone's time maybe focused research on things that haven't really had a lot said about it but still are meaningful you know like where do we come from where you know those types of things if you can answer those kind of questions and it's scarce it has value and so that's that's what you probably want to limit yourself to valuable enterprises well i think you just hit on something important there when you talked about you know the history of um the origin of Freemasonry in Mississippi. That I think is how somebody like myself can sort of bring their focus down to something that might feel more manageable. I, I don't speak any foreign languages. I failed my second year of German, it, rightly so. Um, but I am one of few people who have access at any time to my lodge's records. Uh, I happen to live in the same city where my Grand Lodge's office is at. So I have ready access to the uh, holdings of the Grand Lodge of the state of Mississippi. And so I can, instead of trying to make a worldwide impact on something, I can first dip my toe into the water and say, okay, what can I learn about a particular subject just inside of my lodge? And, and then I can grow from there. Would that be a reasonable first step? That's an excellent first step. And the thing is, you know, you'll complete this project. You'll answer some questions. It's going to lead you naturally just by doing the research. You're going to be taking notes on the side and saying, okay, well, what about this? What about this? And then once you've accomplished this paper, go answer those questions. And so if, if research has a way of feeding on it itself, but you have to get started. And so if you're going to start at it, make sure it's valuable, just like you're saying, and uh, go ahead and complete a thing. But th there's so many people out there, though, that they'll take on a project. And after a month or two or three, they're going to lose interest. And that's most people, to be honest. And so you have to keep that into perspective that when you find yourself slipping or needing motivation or you've hit a wall, do not stop at your research. What you need to do is stop that line of the research, shift to something else, and then come back to it. And if you do like that, you're always making forward momentum and progress. And a lot of times, like I mentioned before, you go back to try and answer those questions and you've already found the answers and you aren't even looking for them. <laughs> You know, Joseph, one other thing that kind of comes to mind here, I shared with the viewers last week that my Knights of St. Andrew chapter is working on doing digital archives of my Scottish Rite Valley's minute books. And 
in doing that, I felt overwhelmed because I had the equipment and the software and had experimented with using it. So I had the knowledge to accomplish the task. And I felt like, okay, this is something I'm going to do. You know, this was a, this was a Jared project to go out there and archive these. But then I quickly realized that, well, I realized a couple things. Number one, I just didn't have the time for it. And it was going to take me a lot longer than what it really needed to take. Uh, number two, that in taking a long time, I was really uh, not really limiting myself. I was really taking away something from the rest of the craft. Because what if something happens to those minutes between now and whenever I happen to get around to, to doing it? And now the scanning didn't happen all because I didn't reach out for help. And that's the other part of it is, well, if I know how to do these things, why am I trying to keep that knowledge to myself? Why aren't I reaching out to other brethren and saying, hey, come in on this project with me. I'll teach you how to do what needs to be done. And this mm -hmm. can be a team project. So yes. can can that be something at any level that somebody could use to sit there and say, well, let's stop worrying this about this being a me project and let's make it a team project. Maybe have a full lodge based or lodge sponsored research project. Well, and I think that's an excellent point. So a lot of the research that you do, like kind of like I said, finding a mentor and things like that, research is a team sport. And so there's a lot of give and take. And maybe you've got information on something else them, so that someone's looking for. Maybe they have something you're looking for. So it's always like a, an exchange. So maybe you have some rare ritual and they have a rare ritual and you guys do a swap. And it's kind of like baseball cards, right? Like you, you have to trade like equal value things with each other. Um, as far as like the team dynamic goes, um, like the, that scanning exercise you mentioned actually uh, very uh, prescient because what we're doing right now is Brother De Hoyos and myself and uh, Steve Adams, we're going to the uh, Grand Lodge of Sweden and we're working in their foreign holdings archives and we're, we're doing like a thing uh, where it's digitizing all of their foreign holdings and they've got rituals, you know, from the 1730s to the mid 1850s for uh, pretty much every language in every country because that king was a collector and none of this stuff's ever been done before. I mean, th this whole archive's never been archived or digitized and so we're going to do work with them we're going to fix their uh catalog and we're going to scan their entire collection for them for the sake of doing it not for any other reason and it's the same kind of thing where we can do this at a local level too um if your grand lodge doesn't have one of those snap scan sv 600s i recommend getting one and you know they're reasonable like between 500 to eight nine hundred dollars something like that and you've now got a thing that can uh take you know 600 dpi scans and rip those images as fast as you can turn the page and so it, it really is the most uh you know one of the most useful tools for doing that kind of stuff in my opinion yeah i, I i've really enjoyed having it i'm still learning the <laughs> Still learning some of the nuances, but uh, but I'm quite pleased with it. So I uh, appreciate you recommending that to me some time ago. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see here. We've uh, Let's say we've picked a topic. I'm going to uh, research symbolism, uh, and I've sort of narrowed down my field, and, and I want to focus on just uh, the state of Mississippi. And so how does symbolism only fit inside the state of Mississippi? I think there's different ways people can apply that. You could pick a symbol that is specific to your area, maybe your uh, Grand Lodge seal, and you can research why the seal looks that way and why certain symbols or wording is used on that seal. Uh, maybe your lodge has its own banner or its own um, logo for lack of a better word. And, and that is something that could be researched. And at the same time, as you're researching it, we, we've talked about uh, the ability to do digital scans so that you can better archive things that you've researched so it can be preserved better for the future. Uh, and we've talked about how if you get over your head, we can uh, bring in team members uh, or at least collaborators and exchange information. So what are we missing? Is there something about this so far that, that have we glossed over anything or skipped any steps to this point? It seems like it's... It seems like a logical plan. Hang on a second. I think my, my uh, Bluetooth thing's going offline here. Let me switch to this real quick. And naturally, oh, that had to happen. Let me oh, try technology. this. Okay. Do you still got me? I do. I do. Okay, great. <laughs> it goes, battery very low. Your battery's about to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you've touched like all the high points. Um you're really going to have to read the minutes and that's what it gets right down to it because like the like you're saying symbolism mississippi maybe you're looking at the seal the only way you're going to know any of that kind of information is to read the minutes 
and it's mundane, it's boring. Sometimes it's really hard to read depending on how well you can read uh, cursive. I, I thought that everyone could read it, but my kids are telling me they don't even teach it at school anymore, so maybe not. <laughs> I tell you what I've learned, and and just as soon as you get used to one secretary's handwriting, another one gets elected, and you got to learn his handwriting. Hey, I've I've seen a few that are just like you know, even in English, they're like hard to come by. But then you get some of that uh, 18th century German stuff, uh, and it's not even the same. Uh, it's not even the same characters anymore. So you know, <laughs> there, there's there's some really big challenges out there, and that's again where that team dynamic comes into play. You're going to get stumbled on something, and you're going to have to ask for help, and that's perfectly fine. No one's perfect. And, you know, you may have a different interpretation. Um, now, let's say like you're doing a minute book work and you're trying to transcribe the stuff as fast as you can. If you can read it very fluently, I use a thing called dragon speech and um, you have to say out the punctuations as you're going. But it makes really, really like short work of doing minute book transcription work. And it's not perfect. But what it does is it lays down like a basic uh, outline of it. And then you go back and you actually adjust all the punctuation and words it didn't get because you're never going to get a perfect rip, but you're going to get, uh, you know, as fast as you can read these words, as fast as it's going to transcribe. That's a, that's a little uh, secret to going really quick through a lot of like massive archival work is using like some kind of like uh, voice recognition software that can uh, transpose for you. So... Joseph, our time is almost up, but before our time runs out, there's one more thing I want to try to cover here. And that is, if anybody else out there is, is like me, you, you sit there and think, okay, I want to do a, a little 15 minute long uh, presentation about a particular subject. But as I start reaching, uh, researching it, I find myself quickly with 30 minutes worth of material and then an hour's worth of material. And so just like we talked about before, there's all these different types of research from a, a short five minute presentation in a lodge to a, a full blown book or anything in between. What kind of advice could you give to somebody about how to either bring a big topic down to a narrow scope and focus that on a short meeting uh, or how to, I think we'll just stay with that because I think if you can do that, then you can then start to flesh things out if you want longer presentations. So, so how do we narrow our scope down for the sake of time? Sure. So like, like, we, like we said before, it's uh, scarcity. Scarcity is the key in what we're trying to do with research, because if you're repeating the same crap that other people said, there's no value in it. So even if it's a 15 minute talk or a 500 page book, depending on what you're doing, you know, the secret school, we could condense down all that information. I could give that like in a 2000 word paper and it would be completely truncated, but you could get most of what you needed to get out of it in those 2000 words. Um, same thing applies to doing like research papers, right? So don't spend your time spinning your wheels on information that's already been given out. Like make, make sure it's meaningful and make sure it's valuable because if it's not valuable, you're wasting your time at that point. And you know, also the time of your readers. So really it's just focusing in like on what's never been said before or something that's scarce or, or, or something that was, uh, been totally misinterpreted over time. Like people thought one thing for a long time, turns out it was all 100% wrong. That's valuable also because you're, correct, you're correcting errors. And so th that kind of things, like whatever it is, if it has value, that's where you want to focus. And you can do that in a 15 minute talk or you could do it in a 500 page book. Okay, Joseph. So for, for our last two minutes, I want to make a, a, a recommendation to the viewers and then I'd like your opinion and, and we'll close out. So I think if you are in a position where you are not sure where to get started with research, not sure how to find those new and unique uh, points of view or everything else we've talked about for the last half of an hour, you can get started by giving a presentation in your lodge that was written by somebody else. Uh, I know I've seen it done a lot where somebody will take a, a, a Masonic Service Association short talk bulletin. They'll read that in a lodge, hopefully with not just reading it, but with some follow-up, maybe some discussion amongst the brothers or, or some uh, some original thought behind it once the presentation is given or the reading is given. And, and at least by doing that, maybe you read something that sparks an interest in you, but I think you really accomplish two goals more than anything. Number one, you're breaking the ice for yourself. You're getting used to the idea of doing the reading and research and giving the presentations. Because I think the, present uh, the presenting part is a part that really kind of intimidates some guys. And then on the other hand, 
it is perhaps a little shocking. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good word for this that does, it's not too strong, but a lot of men do nothing more then show up to lodge and pay their dues. They don't do any research on their own. And if the if a symbol or a historic event or even Masonic tradition isn't really explained in the ritual, they never look any deeper into it. And so just by giving a presentation on something that to you might be old material, something you've known for as long as you've been a Mason or something, it might be something that that is information another brother has never even heard of. Exactly. And so like one of the things we do in Plano Lodge, um, what we have uh, like what, what are essentially table lodges, right? So we have like a table lodge set up, uh, we give a presentation and then we close. So it's not like a regular like lodge meeting, but you guys are doing more of like that whole 18th century thing where someone would give a short talk or a presentation on something while dining together and doing it under like, you know, Masonic auspices. I mean, it, it goes a long way to one, helping the speaker develop and polish himself and build himself up to where that way he can go on to other things. Because like you say, speaking can be intimidating, um, but really it's all about just repetition, right? It's like the first time, like you rode the bicycle and your dad let go of the seat, you know, maybe you fell down and banged your knee, but you got on the bike again. And then it wasn't, you know, maybe too many times after that, you were off and riding on your own. Same thing with presentation and research. And so really it's like you, you want an atmosphere where it's comfortable. And it's also a whole lot of fun having these table lodges too. And so what, you, what you're doing is you're reaching from the past. You're taking some of that past experience, injecting it and making it relevant today while developing yourself. And everyone has a good time and gets something out of it. So, I mean, I'm all about a win-win thing, and that's a win-win-win on, on any way you try to score that. <laughs> Joseph, thank you so much for your time. I promised you I'd only keep you for a half hour. I know you have a family to get back to, but before we leave, last chance, please mention your book again. Let people know where to get it and anything else you'd like to share before we close out. Sure. So you can get uh, the Secret School of Wisdom on Amazon.com. You can have the uh, French version of it as well on uh, Amazon France. Uh, I've got the on materialism and idealism coming out here next month, uh, part of our series for multiple nerval editions. And it's basically every book that Weishaupt ever wrote ever. And we're doing bilingual books in English, German and French, German for everything he ever did. And so it's, it should be a worthwhile endeavor. And I, you know, if you're so inclined, I strongly encourage you to maybe pick up a copy of that book, uh, working on some other stuff too, for the origins of the Scottish Rite, And that will, see daylight here before long and you guys will, will know when it comes out. <laughs> That's awesome, Joseph. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and uh, please be safe and enjoy your trip over there uh, to Sweden. And I hope that you guys find all sorts of interesting things. I know you're going over there for the purpose of helping archive and digitize, but I'm, if you're anything like me, as you're slowly flipping those pages for the scanner, you can't help but be scanning the pages yourself for some information. So That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that doesn't distract you too much. And I hope your, uh, your trip is safe. And uh, again, brother, thank you so much for your time. And thanks to all of you who took the time to watch and interact with me uh, in the chat room as well. So uh, thank you very much and have a good night. See you next thanks, time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.